just to start off, just to get us in a, a frame of worship and that, that peace and that rest that we can feel right now. A lot of you know this song. It's The Blessing. Uh, Elevation does it. Carrie Joe, Cody Corns. <laughs> yeah, we haven't practiced it, but it's such a beautiful song, and I feel like it's just what we need to hear right now. No, it's not in the book yet, That's but it's, it's based on a scripture in the book of Numbers, and it's a blessing, and this is what we want to declare over you and declare over anyone who's watching this from the book of Numbers, that it's talking about the Lord blessing you and keeping you, that His face would shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord would turn His face toward you and give you peace, and this song is declaring that blessing upon you and your family and your children and their children and their children and the generations to come in your coming and in your going in the morning and the evening it's declaring a blessing over you so if you know this song just sing along with us we've never done it before but i feel like this is the father's heart right now that as people are coming together during this virus and this pandemic that the lord is is turning people's hearts back to him yes. and that he's turning his face to them and that this is the blessing that the father speaks over us to bless us and keep us and shine his face on us and give us peace
worship him for who he is. That is who you 
There's a lot of songs I've been listening to lately in Christian music that have been coming out. And a lot of these worship songs are having similar themes. And a line that's been in a lot of them is, you're the only thing that matters. Or you're the only thing I need. You're the only thing I want. And when it really comes down to it, after everything else in your life is gone, He is the only thing that, that will always remain by your side, no matter what. And He is the only thing that matters, comparatively, you know? He's the only thing. He is the number one thing that matters. And that's a tough thing to think. That's a tough thing to really rationalize when you have loved ones and you have family and things that you love. But to get to that point where you realize nothing matters more than Him. she's playing is actually a, a Brazilian song and, but the English part it says it just says his name Yeshua Yeshua his name in, in Hebrew as best as we know it's just saying his name
before his face and say, God, I surrender, God. Fill me. Fill me, God. Fill me. Fill this place with your spirit, God.
that's not out of order. If at any time you feel to come up here, fall down and pray, or fall down where you are and pray, or walk around the tent and pray, that's all right. Do that. Follow the Holy Ghost. You're not chained to that seat. What an old tra tradition of man that you got to be coming to church chained to that seat and one person gets up and speaks these words over you and then you go home. That's tradition of man. I just told them, I said, I've got this wonderful sermon in that podium right there and it's all about a mother's heart and how God uses that in all of us, men and women alike. But I don't feel to preach that. I really want to preach it. I thought it was, I thought, oh, that's good stuff, Lord. He gave it to me. But it's for another time. Here's what I feel to do right now. I feel that we need to hear a word on hunger. And I told I told them up here, I said, I don't have any scriptures. Was it last week that the Lord turned me around with the scripture, with the sermon and had me, was it last week? I can't remember. He had me lay it aside and then he gave me all these scriptures. I had a bunch of them coming to me. Yeah, the glory of the Lord. Right now, I, I don't have any other than one. And I'm going to ask Chelsea to read that in just a minute. But what you're seeing right here, that's hunger. Now, I'm not saying if you're not up here, you don't have hunger. I don't know your heart. You may be sitting back there right now, and you're yearning for more of God so much you can't hardly stand it. Only God knows our hearts. But I'm telling you, I've been, I've been praying about something that God's put on Katie's heart. She doesn't even know this. I've been praying about something God's put on her heart. She has a heart to do something in this world about human trafficking, about sex trafficking. That's something God's put in her. She'll be praying and interceding at home before the Lord. And I'm not going to tell all her private business, but she won't mind me telling this. She'll be praying and it's like God will have her start praying for people she doesn't even know. She may never know these people, but I, I don't believe in betting, but if I was a betting woman... I would bet you that these are real people right now caught up in human trafficking. That God's having her in oh God, I feel that that God's having her intercede for. And what she doesn't know is that I've been I've been looking for this preacher for years that preached a sermon one time that changed my life. Years ago at an Apostolic World Christian Fellowship Conference in Indiana. I finally found him. What, two, three weeks ago I told you I found Brother Wilkett? He's in Florida now, and he's an expert in, a, in working in uh, police departments with human trafficking across the country. He's a Pentecostal preacher full of the Holy Ghost, and I feel strongly to put him in contact with Katie. If it's simply, simply to let her be an intercessor, and, and Brother Wilkett can talk to her more about that, but I believe that there's going to be a, a link between what God's put in her heart and this preacher that I was looking for and had no clue that he was now, um, I don't want to say an expert, there's a word I'm looking for, he works solely now with human tra trafficking with the police departments across America. Now that's a hunger in her heart. What's in yours? You know, who is it? Who says what's in your wallet? Capital One, somebody says, what's in your wallet? What's in your heart? What's that hunger? Now you can sit, you can stand, you can jump, you can roll. I've never rolled, but I've heard some of them do. Holy rollers. You can do whatever God leads you to do. But I'm telling you, I want to talk to you right now about hunger. Oh God, I want everybody here to leave this place with the hunger in your heart for all that God has for you like you've never felt before. And you say, well, I feel pretty hungry, God. I'm, God, I'm hungry, God. You know I'm hungry, God. You know what? I want more. Does anybody out there, you want more, more, yeah. more, more, more? If you, are truly, if you are truly starving and hungry for the Lord. I got to hear that on camera there. I just felt him saying to me as I was sitting there, just because, you know, as a, as a background, during this whole COVID-19 situation, I feel like God has been wanting to, to draw us aside closer to Him because to be honest, one of the biggest reasons in my life where why I've maybe at times not prayed enough or not read my Bible enough or not drawn close to Him like I should is I've said, I'm just too busy. I just don't have time. And I do lead a pretty busy life okay. during my normal life. But in this time, He has shown me that we, even when you're busy, you will make time for what you want to do. That's exactly right. 
Because during this time, the latter portion, I've done better. But at the beginning, especially, I found I found myself binging shows. I found myself self catching up on video games I haven't hadn't beat. I found myself drawing and doing some good things, but I was filling my time with everything except God. He was still getting the small portion that was way too small that he had been getting before. But I, he just spoke to me right now saying, hunger is only really hunger if you're willing to do anything to satisfy that hunger. And so if you're truly starving, there is nothing you won't do to get food. If you are truly starving, you will steal. You will do whatever it takes for you to be able to feed yourself so you don't starve to death. And as Christians, I feel like He wants to bring us to that place of hunger for Him where there's nothing that can hold us back from going and grabbing more of Him. No pride, no other idols in our lives, no other, uh, no fears, nothing that could hold us back and keep us from seeking after Him with all of our hearts. Because I've said for a long time, I'm just so hungry. I'm just so hungry. But I was only so willing to go so far. Yeah. And I was only so hungry because I wasn't giving Him the time that I needed to, even in a situation now where all I had was time. Yeah. So I, that really hit me hard is when you're starving, you'll stop at nothing yes. to get that food that you need. That's exactly right. He took the mic. I, I tell them always, I don't believe one person usually preaches a sermon. Not in the early church. They all had something to say. If you got a word from God, you speak it. No, it's from God. But you speak it. Chelsea, you might need to come up here and uh, you might just have to sit on the steps when we see you read some scripture. That hunger, that's what I'm talking about. That you'll stop at nothing. I read this book one time. We're going to read some scripture. Don't worry. I read this worldly book one time. True story called Follow the River. Remember that book, Mama? Called Follow the River. True story about a woman, two women that were captured by the Indians. Long, long ago. 1700s maybe. Captured by the Indians and carried off. They escaped. They managed to escape. But in trying to get back from the frontier to the settled part of the United States at that time, they suffered great hunger. I think it could have been winter. I don't remember. There was nothing to even berries to eat. They became so desperate, the way he said, that they had to split up and one of them stay on one side of the river and one on the other because they were so desperate they were afraid they were going to kill each other to have food. To literally become cannibals. That was a true story. One of the women made it back and told this story. But I thought about that when you said that, Elijah. They were so desperate. They were willing to do things in that case. Now, when we're talking about the things of God, it's beauty when you're talking about hunger. But I'm saying in the human condition, when we're starving, the human body will do all kinds of things. He said steal sometimes. I mean, I hope we never do that. But when you're so hungry, you will go to any length. They would have to stay awake at night and try to guard so that other woman didn't come across the river and, and harm her so she could be a cannibal because she was starving. You know what? I want to be that way in, in a different way. For, I want to be so hungry for God that I just constantly just want to consume the Word. That I so constantly just want to be in His presence and go do His will. Because when you're hungry for God, whoo, I feel this. When you're hungry for God, don't, don't mistake this for a selfish thing. Oh, I'm just so hungry for God. I want all the blessings I can soak up. I just want to feel the goosebumps. I want to feel the shout. You people from Pentecostal churches, you know what I mean. You get that bass thumping just right and everybody takes off. You know, woo, shout. And it feels good. I mean, it feels good when the Holy Ghost moves on you that way. But do you realize that's just a fringe benefit for you? What's in you with the Holy Ghost that's in you is in you to send you, hallelujah, to send you out for the harvest. It's all about the harvest. It's all about the souls out there that need God. And when you have Him moving so powerfully in you, that hunger is going to drive you out there to the world to share Him with everybody else. Now, we've been counting up to Pentecost. We had Passover. Seems like more of the world than ever celebrated Pentecost. I mean, Passover this year. Because it was a, almost a real Passover. We were quarantined. We were inside like the original Jews in that had just were in Egypt and getting ready to come out. We had a Passover, you know, similar to that. Not quite on that scale, but similar, a type and a shadow of it. 
We're getting ready to have a Pentecost. When the Jews start, when they leave Passover and they start counting those 50 days to Pentecost, they count up. They don't count it down. They count it up because it's a progression as you go up toward Pentecost. And Chelsea's going to read some scriptures. I don't, that one, did you find that one I was talking about? I also want to read in Acts chapter 1. Go ahead and get that one ready. I didn't know I was going to Acts so soon, but we are. When you were talking about the ancient Jews and they were counting up to Pentecost, it was all about the harvest. I keep saying that I'm a broken record, but it's all about the harvest. Katie, don't you give up with that this this yearning you have in you to do something about human trafficking? That's about the harvest. That's all about the harvest because those girls need to be set free and delivered and know the goodness of God from where man has taken advantage of them. What's in your heart? What kind of hunger is in your heart? I can guarantee you whatever hunger is in your heart, if it's of God, it's all about the harvest. Because when they celebrated Passover, it was all about the barley harvest. I've taught this nearly every week for a month or two now. It was about the barley harvest. Right after Passover, the first Sabbath in Passover, the next day was the Feast of First Fruits, and you brought the barley harvest. And it was the raw barley. It wasn't processed in any way. It was right out of the fields. You brought the first fruits to give to God. Now that was sort of an immature harvest. It had not yet come to maturity. It was fully grown. It was the first fruits, but nothing had been done with it. I want you to hold on to that thought. Nothing had been done with it yet. In other words, you couldn't take that barley right there and just eat it. I don't know if you can just nibble barley right out of the field. I don't know. Does anybody know? It's not something I will try. I don't even know who raises barley these days. But, when you started counting up to Pentecost, that was about a whole nother harvest. That was about the wheat harvest. And when you got to Pentecost, it was a mature harvest. You didn't just bring the wheat sheaves to the temple for your first fruits offering on Pentecost. You went ahead and processed those wheat sheaves and you made them into loaves of bread. In other words, you came to maturity. You brought the mature crop. It was already made into loaves of bread. That's what you brought to the temple. I want you to see that clearly. There's a whole lot of this world that's gone through Passover. The blood of Jesus has been applied. They've come out of sin. They've left Egypt like the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They've become a new creature in Christ through the Feast of First Fruits. But then they stopped. There's a Pentecost with God. There's a Pentecost waiting. There's a Pentecost. The Jews never stopped at Passover. They counted up to that Pentecost. It, it's waiting for the world. I told you last week, I'm a firm believer. This is opinion. What you're hearing now, let a little red light blink. Opinion, opinion, not the Word of God. My opinion is that one of the biggest tricks the devil ever played on the modern church is he convinced them that they could stop at Passover. That they could stop right there. There was no need to go on to Pentecost. You know, Pentecost is not necessary. Pentecost. Pentecost is so necessary. How do we know that? Chelsea, go ahead and give me Acts chapter 1. I probably preached what I thought I was going to preach on Pentecost Sunday. Let's just do it. Acts chapter 1. You want to come up here and grab a mic? I don't know. Just as long as you get eight in it, start somewhere. Go a little higher where he talks about I'll baptize you. This is Acts chapter 1. Four. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but obey to the promise of the Father, which ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus instructed them. He said, you got the Pentecost coming. He didn't necessarily tell them. When the Pentecost is coming, I want you to wait. I want you to wait. Don't you go out yet. And these are people that have been going out and healing the sick and casting out devils and doing all this stuff while he was with them. But then he told them, he said, I want you to wait. Until you be endued with power. Oh, God. He said, I am going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. There are other 
scriptures I could go back and quote to you as we talk about this counting up to Pentecost, which by the way, Pentecost Sunday is May 31st. I am so excited already about that day because I can feel this building. He knew what they needed. He knew they needed power. Power that they didn't have yet until the Holy Ghost had been given and came down and was able to baptize them and fill them. That's what we're doing now when we count up to Pentecost. We left Passover behind. It was very necessary. The blood has to be applied to your life, the blood of Jesus. You have to leave sin behind so you can come and be a new creature in Christ. But now it's time to count up to Pentecost. And I'm believing for the most incredible Pentecost that we've ever had on the face of the earth. We just had the most incredible Passover. I believe it for the most incredible Pentecost ever on the face of the earth. You say more than Acts chapter 2? Absolutely. You had 120 people in the upper room that day. 120 people. We could get 120 people under this tent alone right here. You could get a few hundred more if you had them bring chairs all out there in the yard. And I'm not talking about bringing them here. I'm giving you an idea of how many people were in that upper room. Uh, Megan had mentioned a, a week or two ago, there's somewhere in either history, or I don't know if it's actually in the Bible, where it talks about when Jesus was getting ready to ascend. Remember after he resurrected, he was back on earth for 40 days, then he ascended, then there were 10 days before the Holy Ghost was poured out. That adds up to 50, counting up 50 days to Pentecost. But when Jesus was ready to ascend, there's some account that says there were about 500 people with him that he gave the word to and told them what to do. So 500 people heard the Master give His word of what they needed to do. But how many were in the upper room? 120. What does that tell you? Go ahead, Megan, and say it. What's William McDowell say? How many was that? 500 minus 120. 380 people obviously had something they thought was more important to do. Because only 120 of those people were waiting when Jesus said, I want you to go wait and tarry. He didn't tell them how long it was going to be. Oh, God. What kind of hunger? What hunger's in your heart? What's, not what's in your wallet. What's in your heart? What kind of hunger? Because when He told them, I shouldn't have worn this long dress. Sorry, because I'm ready to... I only wore because I wrote a newspaper column this week and said, I'm going to get something out of my closet I've never worn and I'm going to wear it on Mother's Day. And I gave my word I had to do it. But now I'm going to have to hike it up. But... When you talk about, sorry, when you talk about this Pentecost thing, the kind of hunger they had in their heart was a hunger that said, whatever it takes. Now that's all really good when you're in a Holy Ghost service, woo, and they're shouting, and the buns are flying, and bobby pins, and you feel the Holy Ghost, and you get that running spirit, waiting on you to run, Debbie. When we were doing some of those memes for the quarantine, every time somebody would do one of those little meme things, or game things, Debbie was the one that was running. I'm ready to run with you, my sister. And when we get that, when that running spirit hits, it feels so good. And you think, when you're in the midst of that, I'll do anything, Lord. I'll do anything, Lord. Send me to Zimbabwe, Lord, and I'll go. I'll go where you say, go, Lord. Oh, you get to snot and oh, Jesus, I'll do it, Lord. <laughs> but you get back home, and there's a house to clean, and you got to go to work, and the kids need to be schooled, and you got things to do, and places to go, and video games to play, and you. What happens to that hunger then? What what happened to that hunger that you felt? Alan and I have been quoting a scripture for the last few weeks. Uh, not sure where it is, I confess to you. The one that says that, that the human condition is one that we look into the mirror and we see what manner of people we are and then we turn away and forget. You know the scripture I'm talking about. You look, You look and you see your image in a glass and then suddenly you turn away and you forget what you saw there. You forgot what you saw. You forgot who you are. You forgot the problems with you and the purpose in you. Ooh, did you hear that? You forgot the problems in you that you need to work on by the Holy Ghost. But you also forget the purpose that's in you. God's put a hunger. I don't care how old you are. God's got a hunger in you. My mama, she just thrilled me with her testimony when we first got here. I don't know if y'all heard her. She, she was sitting on go. She's like, I, don't know, I forget how you said it, Mama, but it was so, how she's her loins are girded and she's ready to go. Now she looks really, really young. I'm not going to tell you how old my mama is, but my mama is full of fire. 
And some people would tell her, Judy, you deserve to retire. You know, you've worked hard all your life. Look at all the jobs you worked at the school, being a teacher and working up at the church as a secretary. You deserve to just have your golden years, be beautiful and retired. You know what my mama's going to do? She's girded up her clothes. God, my mama skirted up her loins and she's ready to go do the work of the Lord. What's in your heart? Because I'm asking God today, I've been asking Him since this morning. I had no idea I was going to preach this until just a few minutes ago, but I've been asking Him all day, God, increase my hunger. Increase the hunger I have for you. I want more, more, more. Did I say I want more of God? Well, I do, but that's not what I said. I said I want more hunger for God. I want to be hungry. Chelsea, read me that other one you have. Don't say it, sister. Do it. As she was talking, I was thinking a lot about 1 Peter chapter 2 where it says that as newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of the word that we can grow and that we can, if we've tasted of the Lord's goodness. And I think we're at that point where the Lord wants to move his church beyond just milk. He yes. wants to move his church to the meat of the word yes. that, you know, milk may be enough to keep you alive. It may be enough to just survive and just get by. But it's not enough to fill you with strength. It's not enough to fill you with power. And I think God is wanting to get his church past the point of just drinking milk like a newborn. But he is wanting to get his church to rise up rise in the up. power and authority that has already been given Ooh, them by the meat of the word. Yes. To rise up in strength and maturity. Yes. And he said in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 6, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oh, God! If you ask for God just to make you hungrier and hungrier, guess what? He will. And then He's going to fill you. He's gonna, that's a promise right there. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, He's going to make sure that you are filled. He is going to increase that hunger in you. And you say, well, when does it get to a point that it's too much? I think I heard Lou Engel say, maybe this morning, something about there was a preacher. It was either Charles Finney or Charles Spurgeon. I get the two of them mixed up. It was one of the Charleses where he said, at one point he had to just say, no more right now, Lord. It was just so much the hunger that God had put in him. He was like, no more right now, God, because I don't think I can take it. I, I want to get I want to get to that point. And I'm not just saying that because I'm under this anointing we felt in this tent. Do you want to get I want you all to join with me and say, God, give us that kind of hunger. Give us that hunger that nothing else matters. Elijah just said it. There's a theme in so much of the music that's coming out now. Maverick City music. People in songs. Different ones that are doing this music. And the theme is nothing matters but Him comparatively. It's not saying I don't love my children. I don't love my husband, my mama, and all of y'all. Of course I do. But comparatively, nothing matters matters but him. You know, Kirk Franklin's got this new song. A lot of people don't like Kirk Franklin. I get a kick out of him. I think he's written some cool stuff. He's got this song now called Love Theory. And it says, I don't want to love nobody but you. I don't want to love nobody but you. I don't want to love nobody. Love nobody but you. I've been singing that around my house. I've been praising God. That doesn't mean I don't love everybody else. But comparatively speaking, we should love him so much that everything else pales in comparison. I tell my husband, I said, I pray for you. I pray for him daily that he will love God way more than he loves me. I want my children to love God way more than they love me. I want us all to love God more than we love anything else that's in this life. Because we need to be hungry. Acts chapter 1, he told him, I want you to wait. I'm going to endue you with power. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And the other scriptures that talk about Jesus as the Holy Ghost baptizer say he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with the Holy Ghost Dan. I've been thinking about you with this scripture. Because you said some stuff to me that's pricked my heart. And I think you're right with what you've been saying to me. He's been telling me, he's the well, I, I've heard him say, talking about the Holy Ghost baptism. I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. A lot of y'all out there have too. I've been, and I believe it's a continual feeling. That when you talk about that verb in the New Testament, when you talk about the Greek and it's talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost, it's a continual feeling. 
It's not a one-time thing. Do you know how many people I've had come to the well when y'all aren't here? I'm talking about private times at night. You know how many people I've had come from Winston, Clemens, all kinds of places coming to me and say, you know, in 1981, I was baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and then I never, it never happened again. Nothing ever happened again after that. I just went back to normal. That's, that's not of God. When you are initially baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're supposed to continue to flow. All it took was me explaining to these people what the will of God is with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's not a one-time event that you check off your little checkbox and you've got the little pamphlet that somebody gave you that said, here's a formula and here's what you do. You do this, then you do this, then you do this. And when you've checked it off, everything's good and you are fine and just glide on into heaven by the skin of your teeth or either in full glory. This is a continual feeling with the Holy Ghost, a continual being filled with the Holy Ghost. But it says with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Oh, God. This morning, when I was getting ready for church, and when I dry my hair and stuff, I listened to, you know, just music, beautiful music to inspire me. But I saw that Lou Engel, who was a revivalist, internationally known, and I, I follow his ministry. He's not perfect, but I... He's, the best revivalist I know right now. Lou Engle does these little videos periodically. You can go to his page, Lou Engle Ministries. Check out his videos. They're really good. He's an older man. I think he's about, I don't know, 70 or something. He rocks back and forth. But he talks. He talks like this. But he talks. But he's, you know, he's a man of God. And this morning, his video was talking about the Holy Ghost baptism. And Lou Engle, this man that I've been following for years, says that he's not content yet with his Holy Ghost baptism. He said, because I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, but I want the power and the fire that, that comes with it. He said, I want more of that, and I don't feel that I have fully been baptized with all of that. Well, let me tell you something. I agree with Lou, but I'm going to tell you, if you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, He's in you. He's there. Everything you need is within you right now. Oh, God, everything you need is within you right now. Have you yielded to Him fully? Have you yielded to Him fully? Would you have been one of those 120 who's heard the Lord say, wait until you be endued with power. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire that you wait on it. Would you have been one of the 120 that trucked it off to the upper, upper room and said, let's just pray. I don't know how long it's going to take, but let's pray because I'm willing to do what it takes. They didn't know. They didn't know it was going to be 10 days. For all they knew, it was going to be 30. They didn't know. We have no record that Jesus told them how long. Maybe He did. We don't have biblical record of it. They were willing to do what it took to obey what He told them to do. Would you have been one of the 120 or would you have been one of the 380? They said, I heard Him say that. And it, you know, he's and that sounds good. He's right, but i got things to do. Now we heard, um, we keep talking about the sin. The sin is what Lou Engle has going right now that um, is sending missionaries all over the world. And with the sin, they are doing these gatherings in big places. Orlando a couple of years ago. Uh, they did it in Brazil in February. They did an online sin. Uh, when was that? A few weeks ago? <clears throat> and I heard one of the men, Daniel Kalinda. Who was it he traveled with? Who did Daniel Kalinda? Reinhard Bunke. Daniel Kalinda had traveled with Reinhard Bunke, and I guess he sort of took on the mantle of that ministry. He said he was reading the story one day, the Bible story, of the man who came to Christ and said, I want to follow you. I'm putting it in my own words. I want to follow you, but let me go bury my father first. You remember that story? I want to follow you, but... I, I, I want to follow you, but... I'm hungry for you, but... I, let me go bury my father first. And Daniel Kalinda said when he would hear that story, he would think, well, that's a reasonable request, you know, really to, to let the man... You know, bury his dead father. How do you remember exactly how Daniel Kalinda said it? The Lord spoke to Daniel Kalinda. Come here, Elijah. Tell the story. Yes, he'll tell it better than me. I don't know about, I don't know about that. Yeah, you will. But I, I love this story, and I've shown it on youth nights. Go ahead and preach, Elijah. I've shown it at youth nights many times because I, I resonate with that. You know. He says, you know, but Lord, let first let me bury my father, and you would think, well, that's kind of a sucky thing for God to be like, well, you can't bury your dead father. 
But then Daniel Kalinda said he had a moment in prayer where he felt God say to him, how do you know his father was dead? How do you know his father was dead? And, I, and God was dealing with him to say that this that this the, the story never says his father was dead. For all we know, this man was just saying, well, let me have this time with my father. And once my father has passed, I'll bury my father and then I won't have anything in my way. So I'll come and I'll follow you. But the whole point was to say that that is what the devil will try to do in your life. He'll always try to say, okay, well, there's this that you need to worry about first. You know, and Daniel Kalinda says when he tells the story, he says, you know, so oftentimes we think, well, let me get through high school. Let me just sow my wild oats. Let me get through high school and then I'll, gra and then I'll graduate in my life to you. Well, oh, well, let me get through college and get my degree and my career started and, and then I can get my life to you. Oh, wait, but let me just, let me get married and once I can get settled down with my wife, we'll really draw closer. Now we have kids. We got to worry about our kids and get our kids through school and then I can answer the call that you put on my life. And it just keeps going and going. And well, now at that point, yeah, your kids are going. Well, now let me bury my parents. Once my parents are gone, I really have more time. And I can dedicate myself more to you. And he said, the devil is totally fine with you saying yes to God as long as you don't say yes today. Because the devil's okay with you saying tomorrow. Because as long as you live a life where we're constantly saying, not today, but tomorrow I'll do this. The devil's going to hit you just as hard in your mind and in your life tomorrow to make you say tomorrow the next day and the next day. It's the exact same thing that people that say, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to, I'm going to really, I'm going to work harder at anything. It doesn't have to be that. I'm just going to work hard at really doing this, cleaning the, this house. I'm going to, I'm going to really do it. But as long as you keep saying, well, I'll just, I'll do it tomorrow until we can really nail ourselves down to say today, because in the Bible, he Right after that part of the story, he mentions, he says, who can tell me the Bible verse where it says, do you remember what it says where it says, today is the day of salvation? Oh, yeah. And everyone, and he goes, who's heard that? And he quotes and he's like, you know, saying, you know, today is the day of salvation. And everyone's like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. he said me. Yeah, he's like, me, that. me, me. And he says, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that. He doesn't say today is the day of salvation. It says now is the day of salvation. Now, now right now. And so that's the kind of, he says sometimes he thinks people, people preach this, this gospel that makes it seem just so wonderful and full of flowers and daisies, and it is wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. But he says sometimes he wishes he could put a barbed wire fence on the altar and say, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want your God that you're so willing? That you're so willing that you would crawl over that being so willing to get to Him. I think about in the wars that we fought, you know, in the wars where we have D-Day, you had soldiers. We had our soldiers that were willing for their country to crawl over barbed wire fences, to, to go through minefields, to just charge at the enemy, knowing that they were on the front lines, that they weren't coming home, but they were that willing to give their lives for their country. But yet we're not willing, Christians, Christians that know the God that we serve are not willing to lay down the simple things, our pride. And I'm speaking to myself, not willing to lay down our pride, not willing to lay down this person romantically that we're interested in not willing to lay down our passion that we're spending too much time on when we're supposed to be dedicating ourselves to god because we won't we put other things first because we're more hungry for those things than we're hungry for god but now now is now. the day of salvation now, now not tomorrow What's in your heart? What kind of hunger is in your heart? Because it's time for us to go on to the maturity of the harvest. The barley harvest is past. The wheat harvest, here it is. That's Pentecost. And I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to let you close out. If you want to give what, an altar call, whatever you want to do. I'm going to say that I'm not satisfied with the Holy Ghost baptism I, I have. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm satisfied with the Holy Ghost. I love Jesus. Woo! I want to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and power. Oh, with the Holy Ghost and 
fire in such a way that my life will never be the same again. And I'll look back on all my other years and say, wow, that's a pale comparison to the power and fire he's got me moving in now. Because that's what's going to bring in the harvest. That's what's going to go get it done in the harvest. There was something I was going to say before I came up and told that story. Hallelujah. And it was that there is something that has to happen to really have that hunger and to admit to that hunger and it's humility because you think of homeless people that are hungry out on the street that's a that's a humbling thing that can be a shameful thing to have to beg for food because you're starving you know i think about people in the bible days the beggars that, that were begging for alms because you know they had nothing they were homeless they had no food imagine probably the shame and embarrassment they went through every single day having to admit they're hungry. And sometimes I feel as Christians we feel it's kind of the same way because to admit that you're hungry for God is like admitting that you don't have it. Because I've been there in my life where it's like, you know, sometimes you know you don't want to go lay yourself at the altar and cry before the Lord. You don't want to do these things because it's humbling yourself and admitting that there's something I'm lacking. But the thing is Jesus said in the Bible that greater things, greater things would we do than he did. And maybe I've heard some argue, well, that just means more vast. And it's a greater number of things will we do in the future. But either way, I'm supposed to be walking like Jesus. And I'm not. I'm not. And so I pray I never get to a point where I'm too proud in who I am and with God that I'm not still hungry for more. Christianity is not, you're not in the right business if you're in a business of complacency because that's not what God has called us to. He's called us for so much more. He never wants us to get to that place where we're just totally comfortable. Where we're just doing what we've been doing. I thought, I, there's been times in my life where I've thought, well God, now I'm living my life for you. I'm living my life for you. I'm trying to do your will. I am seeking your face. I'm good. I can just chill for a while and focus on other things, but no. Never should we come to a place where we are not hungry and searching and longing for more of Him. And like she said, you know, sometimes you don't feel that hunger and you think, well, what's wrong with me? Because I just don't feel it. I just don't feel that hunger. Pray. Yes. Pray. Not Sometimes it's not even, don't even worry about praying for, well, God, give me more of you. Just give me more of you. Pray for more of that hunger because when you have that hunger, it's like it's like Daniel Kalinda said, if you really were that hungry for the face of Christ and to see what you want to see, it wouldn't matter if barbed wire fences were put in your path. You would climb over those. Which would still be nothing. Which would still be nothing compared to what the King of Kings did for us. On Calvary. Laying down His life. So God, I pray right now in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would stir up a hunger. Stir up a hunger in these people, God. Stir up a passionate hunger in their hearts and in their, in their desires, God, for more and more of you, God. God, help us to humble ourselves. Help me to humble myself. To say, God, I'm not there. I don't have it. And I need more. I need more of it, God. I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with waking up and going to my nine to five. God, I'm not satisfied with my first place medals at Irish dance competitions. God, I'm not satisfied with the world. God, I'm not satisfied with anything that the world has to offer. God, I need more of you. I need more of you. I need more of you in everything I do. In everything we do, we should desire more of Him. When we go to the grocery store, more of Him. When we go to our jobs, more of Him. When we come to church, more of Him. God, more, more, more of you, God. Increase the hunger right now, God. I pray right now that you would break the hearts of these people, God. Break the hearts of this town. Break the hearts of this county and this state and this nation and this world, God. I pray that you would just be raising up, raising up a generation of people that are going to be willing to climb over barbed wire fences to just lay at your feet, to lay at your feet and say, God, give me more. I want more. I want what you have for my life. I want what you have for my life.
life. So I'd say today to you, how willing are you? How willing are you? What are you willing to lay down? I'm not saying he's asking you to lay down anything. But if he asked you to, would you be willing? Would you be willing? That's the story of, of Abraham and Isaac. God wasn't going to make him sacrifice his son. But he needed to know. He needed to know how far, how much he was willing to go. And how much he was willing to trust in God that he would provide when he needed it. And so I challenge each and every one of us this morning, when we depart, I want us to leave more hungry and more filled than when we came here this morning. I challenge each and every one of you to take the remainder of this service, however much longer we go, whether we sing, whatever, and just say to him, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. And if there's anything that you're more hungry for in your life than him right now, God, I pray you take it. God, I pray you take it from their lives. Take anything that would come before you that they would be more hungry for than you. And just say, God, I don't want that. It's not worth it. I want you. I want you more of you, God. Just to 
this carpet, everybody on the grass, everybody within the sound of my voice. Oh, God, I pray for a hunger for you, Jesus. A hunger for the things of God. A hunger for the Holy Ghost to fully baptize us with fire and power. I ask you now, Lord, just to place that hunger like a fire. Oh, I feel that. Like a fire down in us, God. That when we leave, we'll never be the same again. Never, ever. And we'll go forth to bring in your harvest. Lord, send forth laborers into the harvest. And we volunteer, God, send us. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, I don't know who was receptive or who was still saying, no, I'm not interested. I, I can't read that. That's you and the Lord. But I'm just asking you right now, if that was you that was hungry and you received that, I want you just to thank God, whether you speak it out loud or just in your heart. Thank God. Go ahead and thank God for it. Go ahead and thank God for that hunger that you just asked for. Go ahead and thank Him for it.